on the Lord this morning. Um, I'm going I'm to jump real quick, and this is just going to be a question that you're going to like, wow, this doesn't even connect. Are you ready to pay your taxes? Do you pay your taxes? Well, don't ask me that question. That's a little bit rude, right? I mean, do I? Well, of course I do. How much do you pay? <laughs> okay, now you're getting really personal. I, I want to, <laughs> too much. I, I want to look at this morning, Matthew 18. And, and Matthew 18, the ver, verse 1 says, at that time, Matthew 18, verse 1 says, at that time the disciples came to Jesus. And before I even get there, it's like at that time, well, you've got to back up and say, well, what time is he talking about? Why were, the, why were the disciples going to ask this question of Jesus at that time? And it's because a question was asked of Simon Peter about, does your teacher pay the drachma tax? And Peter, like he always does, he just kind of speaks out of turn. So, yeah, he does. Yeah. You know? But then Jesus, knowing what Peter said, pulled Peter aside and said, Peter, let me ask you a question. Do, um, do the king's children, basically, do they pay the tax or is it the servants and others that pay the tax? You know, who who's really has to pay the tax? And, and Peter says, well, it's the others. It's the servants that pay the tax in the kingdom. It's, and he said, well, but so that they won't be offended, why don't you go fishing and the first fish that you pull out, just open it and there's a shekel and pay the tax. And it's just interesting that then it goes into, at that time, the disciples would ask this question about who is the greatest in the kingdom? And it's because they just got through witnessing an incredible thing about, I would love personally when I get my W-2 forms and I know that if I've got to pay my taxes, all I really have to do is go fishing and pull out one fish and open its mouth and there it is. It's because God provides, right? And, and here's the thing about that whole, Jesus is saying, I am the son, I am royalty, I don't really have to pay the temple tax because the temple belongs to my father. I don't have to do this, but I'm not going to offend. So pay the tax. No. And then they turn the disciples come to him and says, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And I'm wondering why they would ask such a question. And I'm wondering, have you ever personally asked yourself the question, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And, and they're witnessing, you know, whoever is the greatest, if you think about even in our day and time about greatest, there's a lot of perks that come with the greatest. A king doesn't have to pay the tax. It's the servants, right? If you're a celebrity today, if you notice celebrities and like sports celebrities and stuff, they don't have to pay for their shoes. I mean, they're great in their line of work and they get a lot of perks. If they, if they advertise a car, usually, hey, hey, why don't you drive this car around? Well, I'd love that perk. You know, I want to become greatest. Jesus, who, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And you know, one of the interesting things is, is that for us, if you and I were asked that question, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? I think we would have a whole lot of, lit, like, okay, Moses. Moses should be on that list because... Hey, there's the, the parting of the Red Sea. There's, the, there's the, the Ten Commandments given. There's a lot of neat things that we saw Moses do in the name of God. I, I would say Abraham should be on that list on who is the greatest. Or David. David took get down Goliath. I would even venture to say maybe Billy Graham should be on that list. I mean, he's preached to more people than anyone in history. He should be on that list. Maybe Charles Spurgeon or, you know, you and I could come up with a lot of lists, but you know what? When we start thinking that, you know what we're doing? We're thinking in worldly terms about greatest. 
Because Jesus doesn't go to any of those guys. Even Jesus, actually, in this question, you know what Jesus could have done at that moment? He could have at that moment said, look at me. I mean, he is the king of kings and lord of lords. But when we talk about greatest, it's interesting as I'm preparing this message and I feel led to, to do this, uh, to, to preach in this message, as I'm preparing yesterday, my phone goes off and I find out that Tom Brady's retiring. The goat. <laughs> Yay. I mean, the greatest is all important because you know what, when he's retiring after 22 years, you know what ESPN does? They begin to list all the accomplishments of Tom Brady. And you know what, if we go into this question, when, when the disciples are saying, who is the greatest, you know what they're really asking? Who has the greatest accomplishments in the kingdom? Who has accomplished the most? We live in a celebrity culture, and it's all about accomplishments. Who's the GOAT? In, in your line of work. Who's the goat in, in Christendom? But Jesus does something so interesting and unique that it stumps them. Because what does Jesus do? Let me see if I can... Yeah. Jesus goes to Angel and say, Angel, can I borrow your beautiful daughter? Takes the daughter. How old is your daughter? Eleven months. Takes Elena. It says this. And calling to him a child, Elena, he put her in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like Elena, you will never enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. What has Elena done for the kingdom of heaven? There's no accomplishments. A child, and again, here's the thing. We can, we can look at child as just the child of God in a general way, but here's the interesting thing. The Greek word that, that is being used here is not the Greek word technon in a general sense. It's very specific for a, a child maybe around a baby learning how to walk, able to sit up maybe, crawl a little maybe, maybe being able to utter the word mama, dada, but nothing beyond that. And Jesus is saying to his disciples, grown men who have been fishermen, who are married, who, who have had careers already, and he's saying, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never. Now, wow. I don't usually like never words, but Jesus is using a never word. You will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So he, he's talking first about salvation and the, and the entering in the gate, right? Christ said that gate is a narrow gate and, and that's why he's, that narrow gate is because you must enter in like a child. So there is the entrance in, but then there is the life then of a disciple of Jesus Christ. And listen, if you're really wanting to be greatest in the kingdom, and you know what, here's the thing about Jesus does not rebuke them for the question. He, he doesn't say, how dare you ask the question, who is the greatest? That is so prideful. No, he turns it around and said, you know what? That's actually a good ambition. That, that's actually, that's, that's really good. It, it may not be good how you're thinking in terms of accomplishments, but it's a great ambition. I'm like, first of all, as I'm reading this, I ask myself, do I have that ambition to be greatest in the kingdom? Do you have an ambition to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Or are you just going to say, you know what, I'm just satisfied if I scrape in. 
if I just, just barely get in, I'm going to be good. Or are you, are you after greatness in the kingdom of heaven? And again, what Jesus is saying is it has no, greatness in the kingdom has nothing to do with accomplishments. It has everything to do with attributes. And it first starts with being radically changed and converted. Truly, I say to you, unless you, you turn, if, if I am heading out this door and my wife speaks to me, I've got to turn. My focus is here. Now I'm turned and I'm focusing on the, my, my wife's voice. I've turned around. And it says, unless you turn. So he's saying to grown adults, unless you turn from how you are living and how you are thinking about things and become, right? And so it's not just the turning. That's why John the Baptist, his coming was not enough. He came calling us to repentance, but he could not change us. Christ in Christ alone changes us. Christ in Christ alone changes us from an old to a new. Amen? He is the one that, 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 that there's a born againness that happens with Christ when we invite him in. There is that conviction of the Holy Spirit where we say, you know what? I know that I have been living wrongly. I know that that I have this sinful nature. I, I need rescue. And so I'm going to turn. And as I turn and I call on Jesus, I become. I become his child. If anyone receives him, they become children of God. But here's the thing. When, when we're children of God, Christ says, now as you grow in me, grow in your child likeness. That's where he says, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest. So it doesn't end with becoming. It's like you have become now a child in Christ Jesus. Now grow in your child likeness. So have as your ambition to be greatest in the kingdom. But to be greatness, but to be great, grow in your child likeness. And I believe he takes a child. And again, I know that in our, in our society, when a child becomes around two years old, we have a name for that. We call it the terrible twos, right? Because that's when they start kicking back. Right? My son, do this. No. Do, no. <laughs> they, they, they get the word no down. So, oh, the terrible twos. And yet Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. You've got to see the attributes of a child at two. Yeah, there, there is some no and there's some kickback, but there's something beautiful that he wants us to look at. When, when he brings a child up to them and he says, humble yourself like this child. You know what? The, Jesus loves to use visuals to help us understand the kingdom in his ways. When we're anxious, he says, look. Look at that flower. Look up at the birds. When we're talking about kingdom values and, and how to be great in the kingdom, he says, look. Look at this child. Look beyond the, the growing part, but look something, what, what's happening that, that's beautiful. With that's going on with that child and learn from that child. Let that child speak to you about kingdom things. And I'm like, you know, we're living in a day and age, and here's again, this is kind of my temptation to, to, to label this sermon was childlikeness versus, versus childishness. Because there's something beautiful when we're looking at a child where Jesus is saying, be childlike and not be childish. And I think what Jesus is saying is actually, when we're looking at greatness in terms of, of, of accomplishments, we're actually being more childish. Go deeper. Become childlike. So let's go a little deeper. What, what does that mean when Jesus is saying, 
Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom. So attributes of a child. (laughs) Frail and weak. So when he says humble yourself, it's like to be frail and weak, when we come into the kingdom, we come in actually very frail and weak because we need to be rescued, amen? I mean, do you and I, when you, if you remember your conversion, do you remember how weak you felt at your conversion? Like, I am done for. And so you come crying out to Jesus, frail and weak. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But that word blessed is the poor in spirit, that's for the disciples of Jesus. So when we come in to the kingdom frail and weak, God wants to grow us in that childlike faith, and it's going to be uncomfortable because he's going to constantly remind us how frail and weak we are. Like, in our seasoned Christianity, we can grow to a place, unfortunately, we can grow to a place where we say, I don't really need to pray. I don't really need to call on Jesus. I got this. I don't really need to to read the Bible every day because I got this. And yet there's things that God does with his children to help remind us that we're frail and weak. But here's the thing. He's also calling his children to recognize how frail and weak we are. That's why we take communion. Do you you realize that part of, of remembering what Christ did for us is remembering how frail and weak we really are? Because when we remember the blood that was shed at Calvary, it took God becoming man to save you and me. It's a very humbling thing to actually take communion because we are reminded how weak we are and how in need of grace. Like when you came in this morning, and here's the thing for me even, when you came in this morning, did you come in in need of God's grace? I mean, like, God, I need you. And, and, and if, I don't, if I don't walk in your grace, I'm even done for right now as your child. I need grace. See, that's a choice that you and I make daily. One of the things that helps me as his child to remember how frail and, and weak I am is, is actually out of the Psalms. If, if I, when I pray and I say, God, would you search my heart and show if there's any hurtful or wicked way in me? Because even as his child, well, I can go astray. You can go astray. It's easy then to go into just going through the motions then of attending fellowship and reading the Bible and prayer. But when we recognize our weakness, nothing then is rote because we come poor in spirit. And it's a good thing because there's grace given to us. So the first attribute of a child is they're, they're frail and weak. You, you look at a child that's learning how to walk or crawl, I mean, one of the things, when, I, when my kids were crawling, I was scared to death that I was going to step on them. I mean, they're crawling, and I don't, you know, I don't want to break any bones. I, know. I was scared to death with, with my children, to, to, especially Abby, when she was our first. I'm like, I don't want to drop her, you know. What's going to happen, you know? Never happened, never happened. But, man, you, you see the frailness and the weakness in your child. When they get sick... And, and they're crying, and they can't tell you what's going on. You recognize the frailness. And Jesus is saying, do you have that childlike frailty? Do you recognize how frail you are and in need of grace? Children, I love this. Children aren't, are, aren't shy on calling out for help. I, 
when I was, when I was thinking about this and, and that coming to, to Christ, when we are frail and we're calling on him to come in to our life, many times it has come with people shouting, Jesus, come into my life. I need you. I'm desperate for you. And yet the Lord is saying, even after your conversion, when you become are you continually calling on him? Are you, are you calling out to him? And, and maybe, it, maybe it's not with the right words. You know, when I was a child, I do remember uh, being, my, my mom would tell me this, that as a child, I would often come to her and I would put out my arms. This is like, what? Hold me. But I didn't get it right. I would say, hold you me. I, had, I didn't have the right sentence down, but man, this told everything, hold you me. And she'd pick me up and she would comfort me. You know, as an adult, when we grow, it's not about getting your prayers eloquently right. But are you calling on your father to be your comfort and strength? Are you continually at this stage in your Christianity, are you calling on him? I mean, really calling on him. I, I love these passages because children aren't shy on calling out for help. Why? Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our frailty, in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray. I mean, when a, when a child calls out or does this, they could be asking for a whole lot of things. You know, I'm hungry. <laughs> Feed me. Uh, I'm, I'm hurt. Comfort me. Um, I've pooped. Change me. <laughs> you know, th there's this weakness of, of maybe not understanding, but then there's the father who's like, I understand. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to take care of you. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we don't know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. You know, the disciple of Jesus Christ who is walking in this childlike faith, you will have a lot of seasons where you don't know how to pray. Have you been there? Like, I'm dealing with this issue. I have no clue how to pray. I know how I want to pray, but Lord, teach me how to pray. I don't know how I ought to pray, and yet there's this reminder from our Father above that says, I've given the Spirit to you, and He's already on it. He's interceding for you with groanings too deep for words. 2 Corinthians 12, 7, and not being shy, it says, so, so to keep me from becoming conceited and here's what happens many times what keeps us calling on the father and not becoming arrogant like I've got this I love this passage because Paul is actually walking in this childlike faith as an adult as a theologian as an evangelist as an apostle when he says this so to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations I, I want you to get that right Jesus is speaking to him. Jesus has this calling on Paul, and he's walking in his calling. That's incredible. I mean, we all like, wow, Paul is, that's amazing what Paul is doing and accomplishing for the kingdom. And yet Paul is saying, well, huh, let me tell you what the Father allowed happened to me. And he said, to keep me from becoming conceited. What keeps us from walking in childlike faith? Arrogance pride, even in the things that God may be speaking to us, like, you know what, here's what, I can be in the word of God, and God can be speaking to me, and I can be like, wow, look what God is saying to me, and then I can become conceited about what God is saying to me, and that's what Paul is saying, like, God is speaking to me, but yet something happened to me to keep me from becoming conceited. I had this thorn, which we don't know what it was, was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me. Have you ever, as you're being used by the Lord, 
is something going on in your life that it's not, it's kind of miserable. You're getting harassed. You know, it's amazing how, it, how, how harassment works demonically because for Paul, it's not given exactly what was going on, but he calls it harassment. And I think in some passages it says torment to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times, as a child, right, hold you me, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. See, see what's happening? He's actually crying out to the Lord. It, it's not like, hmm, Lord, this is interesting what's going on. Hmm. It's like, God, deliver me from this. Hold you me. Lord, comfort me. Get me out of this. It's not like his sentences and his eloquence is there. It's a child calling on the father. What season are you in? Do you have that childlike attitude as you're approaching the throne of grace? Or do you approach it like, you know what, God, you're too busy for me. You know, but what's going on in my life, you know, that's not all that important to you. Is that the father's attitude? No. Father says, come to me. And call out to me, all who are weak. I pleaded with you for you know three times, and yet, what did the Father speak to him? My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in. Why are we so into, you know, when 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 greatness is present? and it's all about accomplishments, we think the person's just got it all together. You know, like Billy Graham, oh my goodness, he probably never had any issues. You know, Paul, man, he had it. And yet Paul is saying, no, I had issues. I was harassed, and I wanted out of it. And yet the Lord gave me a, a wonderful um, lesson Power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I don't know what your weaknesses are, but I think the Lord may want you to see it differently today. How do you view your weaknesses today? I'll say this. I'll give this story because I love Sally. Sally and I didn't hit it off at first. So the very first time I ever met Sally, I shook her hand. Now, you know my story a little bit. I lost 80% of my strength in my right arm. So I shook her hand. She's got a firm handshake. Very first thing that Sally said, what's going on with your handshake there? <laughs> Thanks. You know, I, I felt pretty small, but at the same time, it's been seasons where that would have bothered me then, but it was that at that point in my life, it was, thank you, Lord. It wasn't about the firm handshake anymore in my life. However, 10 years back, it would have been an issue, right? Like, are you boasting in your weaknesses today? View it differently. View your weaknesses differently. Ask God to give you his view of things because you're his child and what he wants to accomplish in and through you, through your weaknesses. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. This is Jesus himself coming to the Father with childlike faith, calling on the Father to remove the cup from him. But then realigning, saying, not my will, but yours. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. You know, when a child is fearful, the child pursues the parent. When an adult is fearful, 
fill in the blank. When you are fearful, how do you respond to fear? Do you run to Abba Father? Is he your first go-to? Galatians 4, 6, And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Right? I love these passages of Scripture. Let them minister to you. Pursue greatness for the kingdom. Knowing the voice of their Father, they desire his instructions so they can obey his commands. He, uh, uh, Luke, do you have that clip uh, I put up on, on YouTube? So let me read this real quick. It says, John 10, 14 says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. Do you know the voice of your shepherd? I want to show this, this clip uh, real quick about sheep and the shepherd. I love this clip. So, yeah. <laughs> One more time. <laughs>
what grace is mine that he who dwells in endless light call through the night to find my distant soul and from his scars poured mercy that would plead for me that I might live and in his name be known. So I will go wherever he is calling me. I lose my life to find my life in him. I give my all to gain the hope that never dies. I bow my heart, take up my cross, and follow him. What grace is mine to know his breath alive in me. Beneath his wings my weary soul may soar. All fear is flee, for death's dark night is overcome. My Savior lives and reigns forevermore. So I will go. I lose my life to find my life in him. I give my all to gain the hope that never dies. I bow my heart, take up my cross, and follow him. I bow my heart, take up my cross, and